have four excellent speakers, no doubt. We'll soon find out if they're excellent or not. Um, so, speaking, the, the debate session as put up there actually is not really a very good start, let's be honest, because it isn't a question. So we have actually just debated over the last two minutes exactly what the question is going to be, which may be seen to be slightly late in the day for doing that. But essentially, <laughs> what we're saying is we, we want to debate whether stroke community care should be stroke-specific, uh, exclusively stroke-specific, or whether it could be part of a more integrated service uh, within the community. So that is the debate. Um, for the um, motion that it should be stroke specific, we have uh, Umash Chauhan, who's a GP and cardiovascular disease and research lead for East Lancashire CCG. Um, and we have uh, Rhoda Allison, consultant therapist uh, in stroke from Torbay and South Devon. And then speaking against, um, we have uh, Craig Wakeham who is a GP and clinical lead for stroke commissioning with Dorset CCG. Um, and we have Julia uh, Mardo, who's a consultant specialist, uh, physiotherapist also uh, from Dorset. Um, so obviously, well, okay. Fine, so what the, the, uh, the, the sort of structure of the debate will be is that each of the speakers um, we'll have 10 minutes uh, to introduce their um, argument, okay, and we'll start with those debating four. Um, there will then be an opportunity for each of the speakers to have five minutes to respond um, to what the other side has said. I'll then open it up for um, questions and debate, and we actually have quite a long time for this, so I want you to be very active in thinking through what your questions might be as we go. And I'd like it to be as controversial and as difficult as possible. Diplomacy has absolutely no role in debates. Um, so I want you to be uh, rude and angry and uh, just sort of uh, go into attack mode. It's, you're welcome to do that. This is the only session within the UK Stroke Forum where that is uh, actually permitted. Um, I think before we start, it might be worthwhile just getting a feel in terms of how the audience is split currently in terms of your views on this particular question. So what I'd like you to do is to put your hands up if you are for the motion that stroke community care should be fully stroke specialist. Hands up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And against... Okay, so you have a job on your hands. All you need to do to be successful in this is to double your score. So uh, we just need another couple of people to agree with you by the end of the debate, and I'll regard your performance as being uh, successful. Okay, so if I could therefore um, ask Rhoda to kick off uh, with her presentation. Thank you. I've never done a debate before. My husband says I like a good argument, so I was quite looking forward to it. Okay. I, I was going to start by setting out some various sources of evidence to support my position that community stroke services should be stroke specialist. So I was going to think both about the model of care and particularly where ESD services fit going to look at some of the evidence for the impact, particularly of ESD, on patients, both in terms of clinical outcome, user experience, the impact on resource use in terms of length of stay, and also the impact from what we are expecting of staff working in community. So this is just to remind us all where ESD in particular fits. Um, previously, um, People stayed for long periods of time in hospital receiving rehabilitation and then eventually left to either return home and have their longer term needs met or not met. Um, the whole purpose of ESD in the community is to replace a large chunk of inpatient care with an ESD service in the community. So we're directly substituting specialist stroke unit care with a community based service. And this is just to remind us of the evidence for specialist stroke unit inpatient care, which clearly shows that being in an inpatient stroke unit is much better than being in a gener generic ward. So if we're then substituting part of that care with a community-based service, 
I must admit, I'm rather disappointed that we're either having the debate that because we're moving that chunk of care into the community, it no longer needs to be specialist. I, I don't understand why that would be. But let's look at directly the evidence in terms of community ESD. So this is the Cochrane Review, which particularly looked at studies looking at specialist teams. So these were specialist staff working within a coordinated multidisciplinary team. And then they also looked at some studies looking at reducing hospital lengths of stay with general teams. And those basically involved um, studies where there were a variety of community-based teams available to support people. So first of all, let's think about what's the impact of those different models on patient outcomes. So this is the, um, the plot looking at the impact of the different model, specialist ESD or general services on death or dependency. So on this side of the line, we're really favouring treatment is a positive. So we can clearly see that the analysis of the total of the ESD specialist services shows there was a good effect from those, whereas the impact of the general services was actually negative in terms of death and dependency. What about the impact on user satisfaction? So in terms of the, the, the line goes the opposite way for this slide. So the other half away from me favours the intervention being a positive. So we can see that a specialist ESD service improved user satisfaction. What about the general services? There's actually no evidence at all. So if you're relying on a general service, there's no evidence it improves or doesn't improve satisfaction. So nothing to make a decision on. What about length of stay? So again, it's all very positive. The specialist ESD service had a positive impact on reducing length of stay, whereas the general service, again, there's no evidence. There's no evidence that general services reduce length of stay. And what about what we expect of staff? So we haven't really looked at this from an evidence-based point of view, but I decided to do a project on everybody's behalf to think about what do we expect in terms of the competencies of staff working with stroke survivors in the community. So I read the whole of the new stroke guidelines and I took an example, oh, hang on, we're going to start first of all with the definition. So the definition is if you're delivering stroke care, you should be part of a specialist team or service. And that states that at a minimum, that team or service must be able to deliver all the relevant recommendations made in the guideline. So I, I read all the recommendations and I decided to pick out physiotherapy as my example. I'm a physiotherapist and you'll see why I wanted to have a little bit of knowledge of physiotherapy. These blue dots are all the motor based aspects of the current stroke guidance. So if you're working with stroke patients in the community, whether you're part of a specialist team or generic team, you are going to be expected to be competent in all of these areas of practice. So I went through them all, and then I thought, so which one of these are considered core skills for physiotherapists that go beyond stroke care? And here they are. So less than a quarter. So the vast majority of things you would need, and this is just about the motor stuff. This doesn't rely on the fact that as a physiotherapist treating somebody, you also need a lot of knowledge about stroke, secondary prevention, communication, disability, and so on. So a lot of it is beyond the core skill set. I then thought a bit more, and I thought, okay, so if I was we are suggesting that stroke is part of a general community team. How would that work? So these are all our blue dots again for all the stroke specialist competencies. And then I, I read a load of other guidelines from a physiotherapy point of view. So I read ones about uh, respiratory care, amputee rehabilitation, osteoporosis, and so on and so forth. I, I didn't read them quite in the same level of detail, and I'm sure you can appreciate that was quite a lot of work. But this is what I picked out. There were all these other things, and just reading them made me realise there was an awful lot about community rehab that I didn't actually know. Um, and I work quite hard to keep up to date on all the stroke-specific stuff. So I came to the conclusion on your behalf that this is probably all too much for one person to manage competently and that the process of setting up a competency framework for community staff to do everything is probably not sensible and not efficient. And my example is physiotherapy, but I spoke to a good colleague at OT, so a, um, one who said to me she felt very much the same about occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, and so on. So in summary, in terms of my position, 
Early supported discharge replaces stroke unit care. There's no doubt that that should be specialist. The ESD studies, which is our main source of research about community care, clearly show that specialist teams improve patient outcomes, user satisfaction, and reduced hospital length of stay. We know that generic rehabilitation worsens outcome, and there's no evidence at all that it impacts on satisfaction or length of stay. We don't know what the answer is. And finally, given that the competency set required, it's unlikely that asking all generic rehab staff to manage stroke as well as multiple other conditions is feasible or cost-effective. And I'd suggest it's probably unethical for us to dilute many of the research studies that have happened um, by now offering a treatment that isn't evidence-based and probably doesn't have much of a leg to stand on. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. Good start. So, Umesh. Thank you. Oh, good. Um, just before I start, um, hands up if there is, you, is a GP in, in the house, apart from Craig. No. Hands up if there's any commissioners in the house. No. Okay, so uh, Craig and I have all the money. Um, <laughs> it's a good start, really. Um, I guess it's, uh, it's worth, um, I, I've taken a more pragmatic approach to looking at the evidence base. Uh, and I think uh, Rhoda has done a fantastic job of looking at all of that. But for me as a commissioner, the practical reality is how do I translate this into something that works for my area? So uh, my area is East Lancashire, which covers a geographically quite a large uh, area in terms of uh, Blackburn, Burnley, Nelson, Clitheroe. Um, and it's... Uh, uh, little pockets of populations in those areas as well, but there's a lot of uh, geographically uh, rural areas uh, to cover in terms of trying to develop a, uh, a sort of a, a, any sort of uh, population that you need to serve. You've got to have teams, and how do you do that? It can be quite difficult. So this is a, a practical reality of how we want to try and do this. So in East Lancashire, we're, we're kind of very deprived. Uh, most of the areas are in the, the bottom 20th, of, or in, in, in England, and our mortality related to cardiovascular disease and stroke is still high. Apparently, we should all be dying of dementia. Um, that might be the case in some areas, but our rates are still related to stroke and uh, cardiovascular disease. So it's a high t number of patients who are being admitted related to this. So it's still very costly for us as, uh, as a, uh, a secondary care or community care provided uh, um, service and we, we have a mixed model in terms of uh, uh, of of providing care so we have a uh, early stroke discharge team we also have a community team as well as a rehabilitation unit there's about 24 acute beds in the hospital the local trust as well as a rehab unit uh, in in a secondary uh, hospital close by and we're comparable to the national data in terms of about just around a third of patients are going through the early stroke discharge team um, assessment process and about we try and get to 90% of patients being seen in the acute assessment unit. But we do stand out. So there are certain areas, and I, can't, I don't think you can probably see it, but one of the areas that we don't do very well is around readmissions. And we have a significant number of readmissions. And I don't know whether that's... If I can look at those in terms of whether they've gone through the ESD team or they've gone through the general team in terms of how that works out. But at the heart of all of this, there's a bottom line, and the bottom line is that we need to be designing services that are patient-centred. What is it that the patient wants? And this is, relates to a lot of the new services that are being commissioned, be it around diabetes, asthma, COPD. We're trying to get to a process where we have services that are patient-friendly, and we know from the evidence base that patients do better if they're looked after in their own environment. And that relates to stroke, to diabetes, to COPD. But it's also, as a commissioner, we know that actually it's quite cost effective. Uh, the cost of having somebody in a hospital setting is far more than having somebody within their own environment. And through the 2020 vision, uh, through the transformation uh, planning that's going on with the STPs, um, we know that as commissioners, we have to work with other commissioners in the borough council, the social care services, the public health, to design a system that allows us to integrate and have 
community teams that can work out in our communities. And that's what we're doing around diabetes, COPD, and it has to apply for stroke as well. But a critical element of that is that actually geography matters, and I'm sure um, uh, folk from the other side will be telling us how difficult that can be, but or organisational boundaries matter as well. You know, who, who are the specialists that look after people with stroke that can look after folk in the secondary care setting but also in the community? And what are the size of your teams that you need in terms of having an OT, physiotherapist, uh, SALT assessment team that need to make up your component that can deliver to a, a population of 100,000 or 200,000? So all of that matters. But the bottom line 2020 vision is that I've got to get 20 million savings for my health economy by 2020. And that's big. That's hard to do. The government's giving some of that back through planning and creating new visions of new models of care. But we've got to take a significant amount out. And that has to be around the way we do things already. And I guess... When I've looked at this, what I've found is, in terms of the core team, there's a huge variation in terms of who that might be. You might need a social worker, you might need a nurse, you might need a consultant, you need a physiotherapist, an OT. But what proportion of their time do you need? But more importantly, when you look at the evidence base from NICE, it's not necessarily clear what that evidence base is for saying, this is the core team, this is what you need it for. And as our opponents will be telling you, that actually a lot of those things that we do in terms of needing domestic help, meals on wheels, apply to the general population because they have frailty, because they have asthma, or they're, for whatever reason they're housebound, you need to have all those things in. But if we want to really provide that specialist care, you do need a core team that are funded for a given population that can do the same as they would do in a secondary care setting. This isn't a a second best service. This is the best service, but in a different setting. So a mixed model of delivery is key. Yes, ESD works, and we need to make it work in the community. But we're investing. I know we're investing significantly in these new models. And there are benefits from knowing that actually you can have those speciality models of care with a core care worker. You don't necessarily need to have somebody who has uh, a speciality in being able to coordinate care across for somebody with asthma or COPD or a stroke, but you know their their role is essential in being able to link in with social care, with community care and primary care, as well as secondary care in that model. And we need a, 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 a classic example for me is the fact that I went to a a, a so-called a beacon of example in looking at the frailty care model. When somebody goes into hospital, the, the trust owned the community service in terms of physiotherapy, OT, and the local rehab team. But when you actually talk to the person who's had a fall and gone through that system, what they found was several failings. And the most important was communication. The OTs and videos still worked on a paper-based record. So when they discharged somebody, it was a faxed re record that went to somewhere else. When the rehab team or the community rehab team discharged somebody, they had an electronic system that didn't communicate with the GPs or with secondary care. So again, you end up sending information in a, in a non-contemporaneous way. So it's either a letter or a telephone call. And often patients get missed. And more importantly, it's that, it, that the whole process journey starts with sorting out transport. So if, if you're discharging somebody, you've got to get critical elements right that go beyond just the specialist team. Otherwise, it doesn't really work. Um, that's a good start, I think. And I'll stop there before I carry on. <laughs> Cheers. So, Craig, opening the debate for the opposition. I was going to say OK. Thank you, Yamesh. And... Uh, Thank you for introducing my talk, because I think you're halfway to my side of the argument already. <laughs> but we are both GPs. That's what I heard, anyway. Um, so uh, both Julia and I are from Dorset, uh, which has a similar geographical uh, mix of uh, urban and rural. 
we're lucky here that our population is generally healthier, but more elderly, and therefore has more health consequences as a, as a relation to it. Um, the ethics have already been mentioned. That scary word. So I'm going to launch into ethics. Um, we all know about the ethics of uh, the patient uh, clinician relationship. It's key to what we do. It's central. It's the frontline thing that we do. Um, and that's an important aspect of, of the care that we, we have to plan. We also have the ethics of interprofessional relationships. And I'm, I'm building a framework here that I want to explore, and my colleague will um, take the practical side of that, as most therapists do, because they do all the work. Um, and so the, the ethics of interpersonal relationships are important as well. Um, as a commissioner, we have a third set of ethics, um, which we're responsible, and Umesh has kindly put that into a good frame for me. Um, I'll just say, point to his talk, because I think that supports my argument, um, about the health service delivery model um, and the public health agenda, which is the fourth one. Now, I would have loved to have had the IT skills, and as the Chief Clinical Information Officer for Dorset, not having these IT skills is a hell of an admission, but sometimes you're better to do that, to have those as a jigsaw puzzle that actually all join together. Um, so these are the sort of the ethical dimensions, and I think we have to recognize that there is more than one ethical dimension that we have to deal with. Um, so a wise man once said, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient with the disease. Do you know who said that? No, nope. William Osler, supposed to be the father of medical education. Uh, so looking at those first two boxes together, because I think we can feel most comfortable in those two boxes. We have the patient and the clinician, and we have the specialist and the generalist we've talked about. Generalists do have a concern about evidence-based medicine. I think it's, it's important. It helps to set benchmarks, but it has limitations. Um, we have to remain focused on the needs of the patient. Um, I have situations where... The evidence says I must do one thing, but the needs of the patient is completely opposite to that. Um, and most of the people that I deal with, I have to trade things off. Um, and real evidence-based medicine is about a guideline as opposed to rules that you must do. Um, and actually, the evidence base, and I think Rhoda's, show where there was a lack of evidence or whether you compare one thing with one thing at two extremes, the reality is we have the things in the middle. We have people with multiple morbidity who are getting increasing amounts of drug and disease a burden on them and the complexity. Um, and how do we deal with those? And Umesh, I think, gave me a, a good one on that as well. Um, we have the challenge of multiple chronic diseases, um, and it's not about treatments between the two. It's about the, also the practical and emotional work of Im implementing those choices, both for ourselves and our patients, and between the teams. Um, I loved this phrase in this, this article that tried to ex explore the challenges. A serious illness is lived, evidence-based guidelines may become irrelevant, observed, or even harmful if we apply them in an unthinking and uncaring manner. I feel that specialists have a key role to play in supporting good outcomes. But I think we've moved into a mechanism where it, if it's not delivered by a specialist, it's no good. I think specialist-led care, where we actually blend um, the practical and contextual with the, with the knowledge, is important. And it's the tacit knowledge as well, and we mustn't forget it. I feel that there is core exchangeable skills, and it's not one person has to have all those skills. I think as a team, we need to have those skills. And we have to help each other solve tricky problems. Umesh, you did that really well again, and I think, thank you for helping my argument. <laughs> I'm really trying hard here. Uh, communities of practice, and I think it's about how we manage the person through the whole pathway, and how we communicate with each other. Um, and we need to collectively sense and make sense of these ideas. Um, there was the, the Wreath Lectures a year or so ago for, with Atago Wendy, and he talked about the, the, the knowable and the known, uh, and the, uh, the known, the knowable, and the complex. In the community, we're often dealing with the complex. 
And I think it's too easy to say everything is, de is um, definable in, in what's the known and the knowable. And if you want people to be compliant with guidelines, then you just tell them what to do, and that's all you'll ever get. Whereas a concordance model, which is what we say is better when we're managing uh, people with chronic long-term conditions, is also applicable to us as to how do we both agree what we're going to achieve. I think the compliance model also has um, a pathway with loads of handoffs and handovers, um, and that's where people struggle, whereas I think we need to pull in care around the individual person. The public health, I'm just going to go through quickly because it's not my expertise, but I, I work with the public health con, uh, uh, con, uh, uh, departments and they really make you expand your mind. And they do recognise that we have multifaceted programmes of care um, and it isn't as simple as we'd like to say. And success depends on the local feasibility. We have three providers in county, we have at least another three or four around county, um, and we have some providers that say, I'll provide care up to that point. And beyond that point, it's not my responsibility anymore. As a commissioner, I don't have that luxury. Um, so we need shared and informed decision making. Um, and it needs to be with local communities. That's both the people, but also all of the people involved in care. I'm going to just leave you a thought, and I might come back to this one. Ultimately, we're trying to achieve the best value healthcare. Umesh, again, thank you. Um, you helped me understand the money we've got to save, the resource limitations that we've got. We all started in the 1970s with Archie Cochrane and his effectiveness and efficiency. Um, we did then add, it's not instead of, quality and safety is important. But ultimately, we now know on top of that, so including all of these, we have to achieve outcomes at, at the right cost, therefore the value um, can help us. I'll hand over because I think you now need to hear from somebody who really does this work. Is yours on there, Julia? So welcome to Julia, who's going to wrap up the introductory speeches. So thank you, Craig. So I'm here really to present the view for an integrated rehab service from a, both a clinician perspective but also a clinical manager perspective. And I think I just want to clarify that what we're talking about here is not removing specialism at all, completely, but actually rather than having standalone separate specialist dedicated services, thinking about integrating those staff with those skills into other generalist, um, which again is a bit of a contentious term because I think generalist services have a lot of specialism themselves, but integrating our stroke specialist staff into broader services that may already be in existence or we may be setting up. So I just wanted to bring it back at the start to think about what happens when you have a stroke. Obviously you go into hospital, you may have early supported discharge if you're eligible or you may not. Um, but whatever happens, that period is likely to be time limited. After that, you have the entire rest of your life to live. And what's important in that life? Yes, the stroke is a long-term condition that is going to be with you to one extent or another for the rest of your life. But for that person, impo other important things are going to be any number of things. Family, relationships, being able to function, managing money physical health, psychological health, leisure, hobbies, going back to work, keeping fit, the list goes on. And I think my question for you is, how many of those things are, only happen to people with stroke? And are we going to say that as stroke specialists, we're the only people who can support people with those things? We also need to remember that stroke doesn't stand alone as a condition. And increasingly, we know that we've got a growing challenge of people with three or more long-term conditions, our older population who can be classed as frail, dementia, the list goes on. These are all things that are happening in our health culture and health context and for the people that we're working with with stroke. And the likelihood that is that as time goes on, more and more people that we're supporting who've had a stroke are also going to be dealing with many other health conditions, social conditions. Now, Rhoda and Umesh have talked about the evidence for inpatient care, for ESD. I think there isn't really a consensus yet about, after that point, how do we structure our services? How do we manage these things? 
But thinking about a stroke as a long-term condition, we know some of the sort of policy frameworks like the House of Care model talk about professionals, patients, carers, working in partnership, speci specifically calling for working in partnership to deliver person-centred care that actually meets the needs of that individual as a whole person. So if we've got our integrated service where we've got some of our stroke specialism but we've also got other, other things going on, what benefit can that offer the person? I think one of the key ones is that we already have highly skilled other knowledgeable staff and services in existence in our health, social, voluntary sectors. Why do we need to try and replicate all of those within a stroke specialist service when we've already got things that may be working well, delivering quality care, delivering them in an efficient way, delivering value? And is it a bit arrogant of us to think that, well, we need to try and do everything for these people? <laughs> so taking a couple of examples, if you, say, have a, a younger person, um, then it may be that they do, they obviously need some of that stroke specialist support, but actually you may be able to work integrated with other people within your service to offer some social support, maybe around caring for that person's family, um, or vocational rehab services, or whatever's appropriate, really. At another point in the spectrum, perhaps a frail elderly person who's got dementia. Yes, they may have stroke needs, but that stroke specialist person may be working day to day alongside somebody with expertise in older people's mental health who may already know that person before they had their stroke, knows their context, knows their care needs, knows, knows that person, knows how to communicate them, with them. And actually, if we're delivering work together, we don't need to be referring in and out of our service to, to get that support. So I think in summary, by delivering things in a more integrated way, we're reducing some of that duplication, which we know is negative for patients, having to tell their sort of story however many times to however many different people, but also that those weights when we hand off people between services. I guess as a manager and as a clinician, it's also important to think about the benefits for our staff and our workforce by working in a more integrated way. So as Craig has already alluded to, if we're working alongside each other on a day-to-day -day basis, there's huge potential for upskilling all staff groups. So as stroke specialists, we can learn from our generalist, community specialists, whatever, um, clinicians, but also the other way around. And that's both at an individual level, but also when we're thinking about um, promoting innovation. There's great good practice in stroke, but there's also really innovative practice in other conditions that we might be able to learn from. On the flip side of the coin, we also need to remember that by working with stroke patients with non-stroke specialists, we're preventing de-skilling of those staff. I think it's very naive to think that a stroke, person with stroke is only ever going to be treated by a stroke specialist service throughout their life. And if those other uh, clinicians, if those other professionals never have the opportunity to work with people with stroke, then when they do come along, they inevitably can feel less confident, less skilled. From a practical point of view, by having a broader integrated service, can be particularly helpful in terms of having a broader staff pool that's a little bit more resilient when you come to things like staff absence, so those sorts of issues, which when you have a possibly smaller specialist service can be a greater issue. So this might be particularly useful in areas of smaller population, or more dispersed population, rural areas, those sorts of things. Also, I think from my experience, it, it can help with staff recruitment and retention if you're able to offer a broader service um, within a post, um, so sorry, broader development opportunities within a post. So it may be that you have staff who at one point in their career come into an integrated service but then develop an interest and want to move into the specialist side, but also vice versa, which may be more attractive than just a, a single stream role. And lastly, for local referrers and lo local agencies, it can be incredibly helpful to just have one integrated service that they are trying to move people into. We all know the challenges of having five different teams with five different referral criteria and, and this, that and the other. And actually, people just want to be able to know that somebody is going to come into a service where their needs will be met in a timely fashion. 
So I've just put in, sort of lastly, some of the things that might be important to make this work well, because nobody's denying that integration is challenging, specialism is challenging. I think it's really key that all staff involved in working with stroke patients and delivering a service to stroke patients have ownership of that service. So it's not just the role of a stroke specialist to make sure that that person receives good care. And that also extends up to the governance level, the monitoring level. This is not just a, a stroke service that operates nominally within another service. This is one integrated service that is delivering care to that person. And importantly, we do need to obviously ensure that all elements of the service are appropriately and adequately resourced. And this is the challenge. So we're not saying that we want to be able to deliver you know, a, a service to stroke patients that then negatively impacts on the care of other patients within that service or vice versa. Alongside that, I mean, Raid has brought up some of the interventions that we need to be able to deliver to stroke patients, and that's absolutely right. What we need to think about is who is appropriate to deliver, deliver those interventions and ensuring that all staff working with stroke patients have an appropriate level of skill. So for some staff, that is going to be the highly specialist knowledge. For others, that's going to more, be more of a functional working knowledge. And part of the role as a stroke specialist element is to upskill those staff, as we've said. But this will be supported by things like competency frameworks, training programmes. I've also alluded to it, but in, to ensure that resource is used appropriately, there needs to be some kind of agreement or pathway as to who does see the stroke specialist and when. And that may be more or less flexible, depending on how the service works, really. Um, or it's more or less informal, I should say. But this is where the difficult decision-making comes around, OK, who's going to see the stroke specialist for how long at one point? Are we going to work to deliver together this, but de together to deliver this? But it's important that there is, I'll go on to my last point, good communication to make those decisions within the teams and mutual respect. We have skills as stroke clinicians, but the people that we're working ha with have a huge amount of skill as well. And I go back to my original point around the issues that people are dealing with after a stroke. Other staff out there in the community are dealing with those issues with other patients all day, every day as well, and we need to respect that. And I think just a, a small point, but things like shared records and processes uh, go a long way to help make this work too. So in summary, um, I feel by embedding specialist staff into a broader integrated service, we're combining those knowledge, skills and processes to deliver truly person-centred seamless care. And I guess my questions for you, for the other side, is... What can a dedicated stroke specialist service do that an integrated service can't do? And with the increasing demand and expectations on community services, which we know is happening, is coming, but without an increase in funding necessarily, can and should single specialism services deliver everything that's required for people with stroke? Thank you. So we now have an opportunity for the speakers to respond. Um, are you going first? Okay, yeah. I won't say much. Okay. Sorry? From here? Yeah, no fine. Uh, apart from saying Craig, uh, we, we've got a... Craig, are you listening? Uh, we've got a specialist uh, commissioning service now through Spec Savers for people who have problems hearing. Uh, as much as I like to think I've given you, you know, lots of ammunition, you weren't listening. You know, the reality is... There is a problem, and it's a basic problem in the sense that, you know, we've got less money coming into the system. But we, we know that patients want to be looked after in the community in their own home, and it's better for them to be looked after in their own community in their own home. Uh, but if we, we can't deliver, or what we need to deliver is that stroke service at an earlier stage. And if you want to do that within the first seven days, you've got to have experts who can deliver that in the setting that is the community and not necessarily in primary care or in, in secondary care setting. Therefore, you do need specialists who are able to translate that across different settings. And yes, we do need integrated 
clinical systems that communicate with each other. And the whole idea of having all these multiple models of care is the fact that we're sourcing this out. We do now have a model that allows us to share information at the same time, and it communicates across different settings. We do now have care coordinators who work for the patient rather than an individual service. What we now need is a specialist to be able to translate what they do out in secondary care into a community setting. And that's where the real results will be, is to have that expertise to be able to shoehorn in to whatever that patient is. And it can't be done by a generalist. It needs to be somebody who has expertise to deal with the acute problems and get that person through that difficult transition. Thank you. Right there. Um, I prepared some slides for response because I'm a bit of a, a bit trying to predict what might come up. So I'm going to I'm going to start though by saying um, Craig talked quite a lot about the ethics issue and the problems with evidence-based practice, and that sometimes possibly the evidence for a condition doesn't so suit a particular person. And that's absolutely right, isn't it? My understanding of evidence-based practice is that we understand what the evidence is. We then meet this particular person and actually work out what of that evidence is right for them, often in partnership with them. It certainly doesn't mean that we don't adopt the best model of care because it might not be right for one particular person. And I, I, I try not to feel too agitated inside, but I can't help it, at the thought that that argument is now being used to say, well, actually, we're just going to water down services for everybody because they might not suit some people. So I really, I, I had a bit of a problem with that argument. So um, in terms of Julia's model, I'm actually stuck a bit thinking, I'm not actually quite sure what this model is that was described. Um, it's integrated with other things. I don't, I don't quite understand what that means because it's like motherhood and apple pie. Being integrated with other community services is, of course, a good thing. But I think Julia, I wrote it down, she said, we're not going to remove the specialism completely, I, I didn't, that which just made me feel more agitated and anxious inside that something was going on under the guise of doing something differently. I didn't have a slide that said what I thought the core components of community services and particularly of ESD should be. I think they've, they've all just decided they're going because it's a done deal. <laughs> if we look at the original ESD research, the core components were definitely the basic therapies, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy. Quite a few of the studies in the original studies had nursing involved, had medicine involved, but all those other services around the edges that were put up early, pharmacy and so on, of course they're not stroke specific, that's, that's bonkers isn't it? They, and so your stroke service does need to be integrated with other services, it needs to have really good links, but the basic issue is the stroke bit should still be specialist, the basic rehab. Right, in response to the challenge about the financial position, I thought I would just review three things. How specialist is specialist? I thought maybe we'd have a little bit of a think about whether the teams should be in reach or outreach, because I think there's been quite a bit of debate about that. And I thought I'd also come back to that thing about longer term needs, so what happens after ESD. Right, so how specialist is specialist? I don't know if you've really read all those trials that were included in the Cochrane Review of ESD, ESD but they weren't actually all completely stroke specialist. So this is back to our box plot of the impact on death and dependency. And in fact, three studies were using teams that were skilled in neurological rehabilitation. So that's interesting, isn't it? We could be a little bit fluffier. If there's a bad financial position, we could say, well, actually, maybe we'll do neuro rather than purely stroke. OK. And in the new guidelines, there is actually a statement that particularly for younger people, um, stroke services need to have very close links with neuro rehab. So you could see there could be quite a bit of synergy there. What about in reach or outreach? So um, in the Cochrane Review, they actually looked at the, the studies that looked at ESD services, and then they analysed them again, depending on whether they were services that community services that in reached into the acute stroke unit to pull people out, or if they were services 
based in the hospital that took people home. So the, the top cluster are the community in reach and the bottom cluster are the outreach. But you can see both, both groups had the same outcome in terms of death and dependency. So whether you're pushing people out or pulling people out, it doesn't matter. This was the impact on length of stay. So the, the trend is that the, the stroke unit-based teams that took people home had a little bit more impact on length of stay. There was a trend, but it wasn't statistically significant. So no real difference there either. So in terms of in-reach or outreach, both are equally effective and no real difference in length of stay. Um, so we could argue either. I mean, I... I guess if we're getting down to the nitty-gritty, I'd probably argue that being based in the community is a good thing because it helps integration with all the other things that a person may need. Right, I thought I'd think about the longer term as well because there's a bit of debate about what happens after ESD and there's an absence of studies to actually guide us when do you still need to be stroke specialist and when do you don't. So we're going back to my competency-based diagram which I did all this work on for you. So I read all these competencies again, and I thought, okay, so which one of these are only related to ESD as opposed to longer-term outlook after stroke? There it is. Early mobilisation. You might have even finished that by the time you get to ESD, mightn't you? So, in fact, all the rest of it is just as applicable longer-term as it is early after a stroke. So if we look at all the competencies you need, if you're in a generic team, there's one less. That's probably not going to make a big difference. So I would argue that possibly um, longer-term stroke care should also be specialist to some degree. Right. Julia made a comment. What did she say? She said, what does a person need? Um, oh, what can a stroke specialist service do longer-term that an integrated one can't? Okay, and I thought of someone I know called Maureen. Now, Maureen was a stroke survivor who sat on the interview panel when I applied for my job 12 years ago. And she was very um, um, assertive about certain things. And later on, I had a chat with her, and she told me about her experience. She'd had a stroke. She'd been on this stroke unit. She'd actually made a really good recovery. She'd gone home. About a year later, she started having this problem with her foot when her toe started getting really stiff her big toe and it, at the time we didn't have any stroke specialist services in the community they were all generic everybody did everything so she went round everybody doing everything she saw her GP she saw um, a musculoskeletal physio she saw a general rehab physio she saw a podiatrist she saw various people none of whom could help her with her toe at all which was progressively getting stiffer and stiffer and more and more clawed, clawed. And then when one day Maureen met a really nice orthopaedic surgeon and he said, oh, I don't know, I'll cut that off if you like. And he did. And Maureen then came to see me later on and said, my, my, about six months later, my next toe got really stiff and I decided I'd, I didn't want to have that one taken off because it actually really affected my balance. And she'd seen loads of people and she was quite a long time post-stroke and it, made, it just made me think, actually, how do you get to see the person that knows what the problem is and can help you with it if you're in a sea of people who don't actually understand and there's no one to take it to? So that's, that's my response to Julia's question. I think half the time people doing everything, there's just too much to try to keep up to date with. Okay. So the competency requirement, just going back to the original definition... Um, as well as saying you need to be able to deliver all the rec relevant recommendations, it does say this does not require the team exclusively to manage people with stroke, but does require the team should have specific knowledge and practical experience of stroke. So trying to do everything, I would still argue, is too much, but possibly we could soften it around the edges if we actually maybe included some of the neuro stuff, had a slightly bigger team that had a lot of shared competency. So I would suggest that community teams could provide input for people with stroke and other neurological conditions in the current financial problem. Um, but I would still say that many factors longer term post-stroke still require specialist skills. And of course, the stroke 
aspect of the team should still be integrated with other services. I, I kind of taken that as red. Um, where, where I work in Devon, we've got a lot of urban and also rural areas. We have a stroke and neuro community team that is able to see people on self-referral after they've finished ESD. Um, and we work very closely with the local multidisciplinary teams. They don't provide the input, but we will link with them. For example, if someone's with a stroke has referred themselves back and they've now had a fall, we'll then have a bit of debate with the community team. Well, who's best to deal with this? And we might actually see the person together or one person will assess and then feed back. They've fallen over because they've got something neurological like spasticity. Well, that sounds like that's probably a good thing to go to the stroke specialist team. If they've fallen over, but actually they don't really have any neurological signs anymore, they're probably going to be more suitable or get more benefit from a strength and balance group and possibly some might mix and match the two. So I don't see why you can't have a stroke specialist, neurospecialist team that integrates with all other community services to achieve the best outcome for people. Thank you. OK, so Julia responding to that. Thank you. And I think we are sort of uh, converging towards perhaps similar points in that this is something around how these sort of services and ideas are delivered in practice. And I guess Rhoda's question of what am I talking about? I'll talk from my personal experience with uh, work in Dorset. Um, is that actually it's, it's possibly just that difference between having a discrete stroke service that, yes, communicates with and refers to and supports other services, to actually having those services being the same service um, to an extent. So uh, from where I'm based, we have a sort of hybrid model where we do have uh, stroke specialist staff who are employed as part of a stroke service, um, but they sit on a day-to-day -day basis and work closely with locality-based teams who are a mixture of health and social care professionals um, who will do the generalist work. Also, within those generalist services, we have staff who meet the definition of stroke specialist in that the majority of their caseload is stroke or neuro, um, as Rhoda's kind of already brought in. Um, but they have those skills, but they are employed by, they work within um, that that locality service rather than a stroke service as such. So it's that kind of blend between this day-to-day -day delivery is this one integrated service versus still a stroke service that talks to when it needs to, but, but keeps the input in-house um, versus an integrated service that involves everybody all the time or as much as needed and can be flexible between the stroke specialist versus the other staff within that service. And I guess your, your patient example, my, my thought on that would be is that well, actually, if, if that person had, been, had come into our integrated service with their toe problem, what I would say from where I work is that, okay, they might be seen by or you know, first assessed by one of our community specialists, but they will know, okay, that person's had a stroke. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. I'll chat to Julia and see, could you have a look at this person or could you give me some advice? It's just that that kind of informal difference between, okay, all right, okay, I'm not sure what I'm doing here, so now I've got to send the person off to another service to be assessed again. I've got to suggest they go back to their GP for a re-referral to X, Y, Z. You can just have that conversation and get them, get them looked at. Um, and no, we can't be, we can't integrate every single service out there. Of course we can't, but we can definitely do a lot more than just have a single specialism service that hands in and out when they need to. And I guess my, my final point was also that, yes, we've got the evidence for ESD, I'm going to repeat it, we've got the evidence for inpatient, but I don't know about you, a stroke person doesn't come out of hospital and badge themselves to me as, I'm an ESD patient. No, they're just a person and they have their life. Some of them don't even know whether they're in ESD or not. They just want the support they need for the right amount of time that they need it. And yes, it's, it, don't get me wrong, I'm not, um, I'm not arguing about the benefits of ESD at all. But what I'm saying is for the people we're working with, 
that's not the be-all and end-all for them. So we really need to all think about, okay, after that point, what can we do? And also for the other 60% who don't get ESD, you know, they still have needs too. So that was just my little sum up points. Thank you. I hope you're all dying to respond to us, so I'm going to be really quick. And I use my usual uh, retreat into speaking into um, some homilies. We've, we've heard about watering down. I would like to use the word blended as opposed to watering down. Um, I do feel the evidence actually supports um, another thing I, I like to quote, which is a model is an invitation to innovate, not a command to imitate. Um, and how do we actually rise to that challenge? Um, I think debates, uh, I, I always took this one on with tre trepidation, and debate is an aggressive form of discussion. Discussion rhymes with percussion and concussion and res results in the same outcome. I'd much rather we had a dialogue um, and I think the dialogue between generalists and specialists is um, becoming increasingly difficult. I think the, the, the story of Maureen, was it? Um, I think that shows the way, the way we've got to, where you end up with an orthopaedic ch surgeon chopping off toes. Um, I think we need to find a way that uh, manages that better And on that point. I will save some of my more aggressive ones to email to people, um, <laughs> quoting Archie Cochran and Karl Popper and Barbara Starfield, if you're really interested. I'll get somebody to tweet them. Thank you very much. So I think our four speakers have really set out very clearly what the question really is, what the debate is. So what I want now is to hear from the audience, um, from you in terms of your views on the, both sides of the argument. If you do want to make a comment, come down to the microphone, tell us who you are. Um, and, uh, we'll, and if you want specific people to respond, then you can say that. Uh, so I'm Nick Ward, I'm a neurologist in London. So, uh, so I have a question to all of the members of the audience uh, of the panel, which may just help focus the difference between you. So the, the differences between um, the generalist and the specialist approaches, you could consider these as interventions that could be looked at in a clinical trial. So if it was a clinical trial you were looking at, you'd have to pick a primary outcome score. So in very few of your discussions, was it clear how you're going to decide which is best. So which primary outcome measure would you take to decide which is the best of these types of interventions? Would you go uh, something, uh, one extreme such as cost, or the other extreme you could go and look at impairment, for example, or something in the middle? Okay, shall we start here? I think ultimately what we have to appreciate is the need to deliver value, which is the product of um, outcome divided by cost. Uh, if you narrowly define your outcome, um, then I think you have a very um, stilted. Um, and if you achieve, if you go after outcomes at whatever cost, uh, then your value drops. Uh, and that is one of the challenges. It is complex. Shall I guess? I, I think the um, original ESD studies really looked at death and dependency as the clinical outcome measure, and I would suggest that's what we use. Um, I, I feel I feel very nervous. I, I know it's a difficult financial position, but I feel very nervous that health services are being designed purely around cost at the moment, with very little thought to actual the effectiveness. And I would suggest it's not cost effective just to think about the cost at the beginning. Um, I was going to say something else, but it slipped away from me. But I actually, I mean, can I come back on that? I mean, the opposition there did not build their argument around a cost argument. Did they? In fact, I was struck by how little money was actually mentioned by I think I was just left. going to say I agree with Rhoda in that I, you know, I don't disagree with Craig. I think that is a key argument, but... I think at this point we, we don't actually always know how to measure long-term outcome. Yes, we have death dependency institutionalisation rates, but this is a challenge for how do we measure the real quality and the value that we're, of what we're delivering to the patient in terms of their long-term health and well-being. And this is what we're thinking about here. We're not just thinking about their, in, their um, improvement after six weeks. It's how do they manage the rest of their lives. And I think that is a challenge just generally. OK, take another question. I think I saw a hand up there. Yep, please. Oh, hi. I'm um, Kate Kelly. 
I'm an occupational therapist working in London hospitals um, managing stroke and rehab services. So um, I just wrote some notes because you said some quite interesting points where I kind of feel a little bit passionate about from being a therapist who's been in stroke care for a long time. And one of you talked about best value. And I think from a therapy perspective, we are kind of doing the rehabilitation from the straight from HAGI, from the hyperacute stage, right through into the kind of rehab into ESD. And I think what's happened over the last two years in stroke care is there's been a real push to get people out of the acute stroke services very quickly into ESD. And if we take a model from a neuroscience perspective where we've got a crit critical window of being able to do good therapy that's from a restorative approach, that patients are getting 45 minutes, hopefully, within the first kind of 21 days on acute stroke unit, then into ESD where they might see an OT for six sessions. So if I was um, a stroke patient, I'd want a specialist stroke therapist to come in and be able to start from scratch and know exactly what needs to be dealt with and what I need to do to be able to recover from my stroke. Knowing that when we see patients in London post-stroke of nearly six months, they're getting no therapy. And we see people in clinic that will turn around to myself and a physiotherapy colleague and go, well, actually, I've written down that I've got to recover within, um, the ne in the next 12 weeks and I know my therapy is going to stop. So my argument is that, that we've got to have specialist therapists delivering specialist stroke rehabilitation because they're going to be able to analyse and give good clinical reasoning about what's got to be done in what you quote say is the best value of care because that's all we can afford. So if you do generalist, do generalist therapists come in and go, it's going to take me a couple of sessions to work out what the problem is here, so I'm actually going to take a compensatory approach, i.e., my arm doesn't work, so can I put a sling in my arm in a sling because I'm going to work on your legs and get you walking because that's probably the quickest thing I'll be able to do in the next six weeks. So I suppose my argument, in a very kind of roundabout way, is our generalists doing comp compensatory therapy and our ESD therapists doing restorative therapy. I'd like to open that to the, to the floor, really. On which type of approach would you think would be value for the patient? Because from my perspective, if I was a stroke patient, I want to know that... I was going to have that window of opportunity to get the best practice as quick as possible, knowing that the community service is going to stop. Okay, thank you. Julia? Um, yeah, and I would agree in that having the specialism at the right time is important, and perhaps thinking about Craig's slide on, on expert-delivered versus expert-led may be useful um, in answering this, in, in that perhaps rather than having your block of six specialist sessions in one go at the beginning, it may be that you can actually weave that in with some uh, more community specialist input so that you get better value in that you're delivering the same amount of input but actually um, maybe spread over a longer period um, where some of those broader needs in between those interventions may be managed by a, a community specialist rather than a stroke specialist. That's just one idea. Um, but, yeah, I think none of us... We, we, we got given a get-out-of-jail-free card in, in this, in the way, and that we haven't had to argue for a purely generalist service because I don't think we could do that. I think we do acknowledge that there needs to be some stroke specialism, and the advantage of having that embedded within other services is that you have some flexibility in how and when that is used. So. Okay. Rhoda? Okay. Um, right, first of all... I. I I wasn't completely sure what you meant about having only six sessions of OT. <coughs> I wasn't sure if you meant that's only six sessions with the specialist and there's other sessions or well, that was it. If you're going to give a long speech, could you just go to the microphone so that when they record it, they can be heard? I kind of gave an average because we've done a recent review, and ESD um, in across London is not um, standardised. So some patients do get ESD for six weeks, but some only get it for two weeks, and then end up in a kind of generalist environment. Okay, thank you. Um, so it's not even, it's not, we're not even got ESD. So no, it doesn't, sound, it, well, it, that doesn't actually sound like ESD, yeah. does it? I mean, the whole purpose of ESD is that you get the same intensity as you should have on the stroke unit. So uh -huh. people should have input every day um, when they first go home, if that's what's appropriate. Um, 
I, I, I'm still I'm still struggling a bit with this idea of well we're we're mixing a bit of stroke specialist in with generic and we'll weave in your stroke specialist and then you can see a community person the rest of the time. That doesn't sound well, it, it, it doesn't sound like a good model to me with lots of handoffs. Um, I, 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 I agree with with your point. I think and one of my sorry I'm a bit my head's all over the place. One of my little blue buttons about competencies was about people actually having the knowledge to understand what are the prognostic indicators for this aspect of your care. So should I be intervening now or later or what, what should we be doing? So that, for example, if you've got somebody with an arm that's got no function, you're not spending a lot of time trying to re gain function at a time when it's not appropriate or your whatever. So I think having the right person that understands what, what the options are saves a lot of wasted time. Exactly, yeah. I also <clears throat> think a lot of rehab is all about practice actually. So in fact in our specialist team we have a lot of skilled non registered staff. So actually, we, we, we're an efficient model by saying, actually, we don't actually necessarily need a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist that goes in every day, but they will go, you, go in and set you up with a skilled non-registered band three who actually work, is, is stroke-specific, mm -hmm. who will then have a really good go at getting you to practice, practice, practice. Sorry. Yep. Um, in terms of commissioning, um, for me, if you're looking at outcomes, you shouldn't have any difference in outcomes for somebody who spent... Uh, two weeks or three weeks on an acute stroke unit versus somebody who's gone home within a week. So in terms of having access to the relevant services, we need to commission something that allows us to be able to say the outcomes will be the same, but this is more about... Uh, uh, the bottom line is it is a more cost-effective service to have patients being cared for within their own homes. So we've got to be able to design services to do that. Now, the threshold at the moment is to say about 40% of all your strokes should be able to access ESD. Um, nationally, we're only getting up to about 30%. Um, some areas do it better than others. But if you could get up to 40%, then that's a cost saving. That means we can invest as commissioners into community services that allow us to deliver that model in a more effective way. I just wanted to respond quickly in terms of, I think the, the weaving and the blending, that's very much where if you're working day to day together on a, on a, you know, you know each other, that can be, that doesn't need to be in a handoff basis, it can be in a really kind of quite fluid basis. But also it gives us the flexibility to target the specialism where it's most needed um, in that sometimes we may have specialist services where people come into the service because they have a diagnosis of stroke, but actually the stroke isn't their predominant need. And if we've got more flexibility within our service, we can actually target those who most need that specialist input and where people may have had a stroke, but actually their other needs aren't predominantly stroke, we can use other resources to, to manage those more effectively. Thank you. Okay, next question. Feeling a bit short. Um, I'm Sarah Rickard. I'm from the Greater Manchester Stroke Operational Delivery Network. Um, we've spent this year focusing very much on our post-acute care, having spent quite a lot of time focusing on our rather successfully on our acute care, which has, has shown huge improvements. Um, and actually, I've late this morning was I, uh, late because this morning I spent um, finishing off a report, um, 23 exciting pages of a review of our post-acute services in Greater Manchester, which is. 13 CCG, 17 teams, delivering a, a, a myriad of different services across the, um, the conurbation, and depending where you live, you get a, a range of different things. Um, I just wanted to, I was quite pleased when you were talking about the um, integration potentially with neurological services, because we're working alongside the neuro rehab ODN um, in this piece of work, because a lot of the community teams um, there see stroke patients. Um, and we're doing a piece of work together to look at how we can move forward with models of care that, that in, kind of uh, encompass this integrated approach. Um, and we've actually, particularly in stroke, we've had a lot of talk about ESD and where, what patients do after ESD. And the model that we're advocating in Greater Manchester is one where we have a, a community stroke service, which may be part of a larger neurological service. So there is um, more um, flexibility um, that, that sees all stroke patients being discharged from our hyperacute stroke units or our local hospitals um, and that we don't have a sort of ESD criteria per se um, that they would see all patients which actually removes some of the problems that we have with 
creating cohorts of patients that then get handed on, they're reassessed, they join waiting lists. And I just wondered what your view were, was on those sorts of models and how we could be moving forward with those rather than um, implementing ESD, which actually creates its own, its own problems. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. Um, the, the, team, the team I work in, uh, we see anybody with stroke that leaves hospital. So you might come out on an ESD pathway, which means we're aiming to see you seven days a week initially, or you might come out and be moving to a care home for, for the final months or something, in which case we might go out and our role is to make sure the care home are happy with how they're looking after you, positioning and so on. So we, you go to the same team, whatever, um, but the actual intervention you get might, might, might vary in intensity, but it also means that you, your intensity, if you're on ESD, steps down, but you still stay with the same team. So, yeah, I think, personally, I think that works quite well. Craig? I think linking the, 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 the two, the reason why ESD is such a debated, debated problem is because it, it is important. It's important for the, uh, for the patient, but it's also important for the provider and the commissioner. Uh, because if people aren't, um, uh, who are suitable for ESD aren't being offered that, um, then they're blocking beds for people who are pushing from the other side. Um, so it's important that we get this right. The model by which we get it right is something that we'll sort out by working together. Um, and I think the whole pathway needs to flow and function. Um, to and picking up on the first person, you know, the, the neurological damage needs to be limited as much as possible, and you need to start the what was the phrase you used? Um, it's not compensatory; it needs to be restorative. It's restorative. Um, and I think we need we need to make sure that the whole system can can achieve, but it has to achieve it um, in a way that's effective and within the resources it has available. Thank you. Next comment. Hello, uh, Alex Streets, neurologic music therapist. Um, I was just wondering. Um, how much patients understanding the importance of, of dosage and, and level of rehab would actually influence the commissioning of, of service and, in fact, the cost effectiveness as well. So if, if there's any sort of data on the correlation. I think you've perplexed them. Um, I, I'm not aware of any studies looking yeah. at patient awareness. Is that what you mean? <coughs> yeah, so, I mean, um, if, if patients really understand what they need to do, if they have a good chance of recovering speech or, or limb function or something like that, um, that they would then be more likely to be commissioned the appropriate sort of ESD. I don't know. I mean, I think the, the bit that's missing in the conversation we've had, I think a lot of, and I scribbled it down earlier about the finances, was rather than having this rather, what sounds like quite a paternalistic view, we don't have the money, so we're going to design a slightly different service. We need to be having this conversation now with user representatives, don't we? So I think in a strategic point of view, we need to bring service users in. <laughs> One thing I kept scribbling that I haven't managed to say yet was stroke is the leading cause of disability. So actually, why would we not want services that were aimed at treating those people to the very best to reduce that? So I think that's important. I think on a day-to-day -day level, patients being aware of the dose they should have, I'm not sure that's really been explored. It's a very complicated, multifactorial mm -hmm. thing, isn't it? It is a very difficult issue, isn't it? Because actually when you go out, when you hear people coming back about the concerns they have around the new commissioning arrangements, the suggestions within the STPs, actually it's largely about the design of the hospital services. There's quite a lot of feedback around the possibility of community hospitals being closed. I just, was just looking at the Cumbria one this morning. Um, actually, you get very little coming back around the design of community services. And that's something which I think we probably do need to educate people about, isn't it? And to be able to get a feel, better feel, really, in terms of the patient view. Yeah, please, Craig. The, the um, uh, in Dorset, we've uh, been undertaking a clinical services review, which, which did exactly what you said, uh, fell into the trap of redesigning your hospital services. We eventually woke up to the fact um, that you can't redesign the hospital services without having an effective uh, community-based service, which includes how do you make the use of your community hospital estate and your community teams. And it's not 
is it primary care, is it community, is it um, specialist, it's how do those work together. So our SDP is now built on the hospital reconfiguration but also the configuration of community services to make that a reality. Um, it's, it's a bigger piece of work but it has to be done. Thank you. Juliet. Hi, I'm um, Juliet. Sorry, I need to <laughs> tiptoe here to get to the microphone. I'm Juliet Bouvery, the new Chief Executive of the Stroke Association. I just wanted to pick up on a reference that Rhoda made to um, patients and their needs and preferences. It's interesting for me that we're having a discussion about optimal service models, but we're not really having that discussion based on a really good understanding of patient need and patient preference. And we all know that stroke um, affects everybody quite differently and that needs change over time and I'd just be interested in the panel's view on whether we really do know enough at different points in time and for different segments of stroke survivors what their needs are what their preferences are and then how we design optimal services to be truly needs-led and person-centered I'll go down the line actually for this give you all an opportunity to comment. <laughs> no, um, just thinking for a second. Do you want to start? Yeah, go on if you put um, As Commissioner, I think it's critical that the services provided need to learn from what they're doing, and a key element of the reporting that we're asking for is uh, patient satisfaction. Um, I think, you know, at the moment, all the, all the services are, de are delivering highly um, satisfied uh, customers, if you want to call that, but they're people who use our service. Um, so I think it's, it's important that any service really learns from what it's actually delivering. Can I just make the point that actually the pr trouble is, maybe you were saying that, is that we survey the people who are getting the services. We don't survey the people, by and large, apart from stroke association surveys and things, the people who are stuck at home without anything uh, three to six months following their stroke. Anyone else want to comment? I won't force anyone. So I was just going to add, I mean, the Devo Mank might be a good example of potentially how you're looking at integrated service that involves social care as well as... as uh, community care uh, or health care being engaged with trying to deliver something that's person-centred. Um, my experience as a GP is that patients, be it related to stroke or diabetes or dementia, prefer to be looked after at home. And the sooner they can get home, the better they find it. Um, clearly, you know, we're dealing with a, a very elderly population or ageing population, and we don't have the workforce to be able to uh, have everybody in a care home or a nursing home and certainly that's not that's not the model that's been designed in terms of delivering care um, my experience would be to suggest that we need to get better at being able to deliver care within a person's own environment okay, thank you number one Hi, sorry, I have to adjust this as well. Um, hi, I'm Cathy Anson. I'm a clinical lead um, at a hosp one of the hospitals in Surrey. Now, in Sur Surrey, we're undergoing a big um, like Surrey stroke review. And as part of that, we've got the opportunity, as my trust has got the opportunity to um, take over um, a like an ESD service that's currently run by an independent provider. So we've got the opportunities now to try and create where we think we've already had challenges and barriers to, to do that. So it's really interesting to listen to both sides like of these different sort of arguments slightly. But I just wondered on a practical note a little bit about in when we've got the opportunity now to design and review our service, how with stroke specific care how, what you think about in terms of the staffing and the skill mix within that. So in terms of stroke specialist care, now we could say that stroke specialists, you have to be a band seven or a six that's within that worked in that area. But obviously in terms of development of staff, we need to integrate different bandings and different skill mix. So I wondered what you thought as your arguments in terms of like your skill mix and like the bandings and the use of band fives and how to develop um, those, those skills and, and staff are. Sorry. I think that it probably goes back to my point around um, sort of a suitable frameworks for competencies and training and supervision and, and all that stuff that is, is not stroke specific. Um, I, I personally don't feel like everybody needs to be a band seven or, or anything like that. I think it's, it's around what those individuals have skills and experience of knowledge and are able to deliver and 
and there may be a distinction between those who are already in the service not able to deliver that now versus those you're delivering. I think we do have a challenge in terms of staffing and skill mix and that we have some recommendations for that you know, for our ESD period, but what about all the rest? That's a bit murkier. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's as much around, not so much around banding necessarily, it's around what can those staff offer. But I, um, I, I think it's really important to have staff at all levels and um, I suppose it depends how big your service is. We, um, at one point, we did some skill mix review on our stroke rehab unit to, to get more skilled non-registered staff looking at what, what people needed to practice. And um, in the end, we got rid of our band five OT and physio post at the time because there was a, there's a um, quite a high turnover of patients. So we felt we needed quite senior clinical decision makers at seven and six for OT and for physio. But it, it's obviously really difficult. Um, we're now in the process. We've become an integrated care organisation. So all aspects of the stroke pathway and all community services fit under the same provider. So we're now joining up all the staff from the acute stroke unit, the rehab unit, and the two community teams. And that's enabled us to put band five rotations back in that rotate around the pathway and, and across other services. So, but I think you also need to think about your threes and fours as well, don't you? Because they're, they're critical. A lot of it is practice. So a lot of it is having appropriately trained, skilled, non-registered staff to do stuff with as well, I think. Okay. Can I just, sorry, can I just ask one extra bit for that? So in terms of the integrated care model you were describing more in Dorset, um, obviously I think in an ideal world for us that would be absolutely great, but a lot is taken out of control because we don't own or provide those community services. So I just wondered what the model was in Dorset and if that was the same barriers or challenges you had or you actually were able to own that as part of the pathway. Um, I think it, a little bit. Like I reflect today, we, just, we have a bit of a hybrid at the moment and as Craig alluded to, everything's up for review at the moment and it's likely to change. Um, but we, we do have some 100% dedicated stroke specialist staff who are a mixture of band six and seven, um, but we do also have our other staff who are based within the, I would say, the generalist service who, um, a bit like Rhodes is saying, we, we've got every everything from 6-5 and definitely agree that band non-qualified staff are crucial as well and thinking about skills and competencies for those are, is, can often be forgotten if you're not careful. So we have a bit of a, um, a hybrid model of, say, those who come under our stroke banner are band 6 and 7, but would, we would still have staff who are stroke skilled who are other bandings, really. Okay. So, Ms. Jeffries, I also lead an ESD team in Devon. Um, I've got a question for you, Julia, really, bearing in mind, as Rhoda said, that ESD for stroke should be the equivalent of a stroke rehab unit. How can you ensure when patients go home that you've got the capacity to provide instant intensive therapy for those stroke patients? Um, that partly comes back to commissioning and how the service is commissioned. So we do, at the moment, in, in our service, we have separately commissioned ESD to ensure that those standards can be met for ESD versus the rest of the pathway. However, that is something that we're looking at, and part of the argument is that um, by separately commissioning ESD, we're almost setting up artificial pathways that don't always fit with the patient needs. So we still want to be able to off have the right resource to be able to deliver ESD as it's intended to be, but not necessarily that that needs to be a standalone service just because it's separately commissioned. Okay. I think if there are no more questions, what we'll do is uh, have a vote again. I'm pro oh, oh we've got somebody else. Hello, my name's Heather Hazard. I'm a community stroke specialist nurse in North Cheshire. Um, I think my role's as rare as hen's teeth, um, but I think it's a very valuable role, and it showed a great deal of promise over the last few years. Um, I work independently of the other teams, but with liaising with all of them, so we've got neuro rehab, um, if they need for the more complex cases, there's generalist rehabs, um, clinical psychologists who specialise in neuro, um, speech and language, etc. The whole the whole gambit. Um, and I think perhaps we're 
as big as the room is mostly therapists, we're tending to think more, a, a little bit more about function, whereas I'm trying to think a lot more about the whole quality of life, the holistic approach. Um, and I think it would be certainly worth you thinking about the two gentlemen from the CCGs, how valuable that could be. I save a lot of GP time and money. Um, I treat the medications, etc. So I, I case manage all strokes that come out into the community, whether they be ESD or non-ESD. Um, and I think from Julie's little dots, <laughs> sorry, Rhonda's little little dots, um, I could co I can cover and give guidance or support or signpost to the right places, virtually all of those, if not all. And I just wanted to say that I think maybe that's something that's worth thinking about, that to have someone who can overarch and work with all the other services. Thank you. In a clinical way. Okay. There's so. One, there's one more person making a break for it, I think. <laughs> break for it. <laughs> I'm trying to escape. <coughs> It's Bridget Bergen, Stroke Association. We carry out an enormous number of six-month reviews, and increasingly they show growing amount of unmet needs. And we've heard earlier about um, six sessions. I think some of the patients that we see, some of the service users haven't even had six sessions. Um, so my question is, as we move towards um, more generalist services, are we in a, in a situation where we're going to make the number of unmet needs and the level of, of need that needs to be met um, even worse? Okay, I'm not going to ask them to answer that because I think it's, it's sort of putting the question in there. Uh, I'll let the audience decide that when we take the vote. Because I think we've heard probably the arguments on both sides really and probably not much further to add to that. So the trouble with debates is that they are very polarizing and actually by and large the questions however well you design the questions um, there's always going to be quite a significant overlap between the two teams and I think we've heard that to today four very strong cases being made first thing is I want to just take a, a, a vote on the question which is on which we have been debating that was up, up on the screen should we have specialized uh, stroke services in the community or should they be more integrated. So hands up for those who are still in favour of the motion. Okay. And those against? So I think we've probably not swung the debate very much on that side. Can I now just try and do it in a little slightly more nuanced way? Did anybody change their mind? Okay. <laughs> so can I now just take, because I think that community services covers a whole spectrum, doesn't it? From the time that people leave hospital through to, well, indefinitely, until the end of that patient's life and the end of the time when they might need further rehabilitation. So, hands up those people who feel that early supported discharge um, is something which we could make more generic. I think we had very few in the audience who were going to argue that. So, specifically, early supported discharge, can it be a generic service? Anyone in favour of that model? No one. Um, and I think that is an important statement to make because I'm afraid that around the country there are services which where there, that, that debate is going on. I what about... Be, uh, can we talk about the Neurolink? I'm going to do that so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm chairing this meeting. Okay. <laughs> so what about those people who actually think that you could have a joint neuro... Um, stroke specialist early supported discharge team. Anyone in favour of that? Okay. As long as they've got stroke specialist skills. As long as they've got stroke specialist skills. Hands up those people who think we should actually adopt a purist approach and have early supported discharge as stroke alone. Come on, be brave, put your hands up. I can't see there. A few. Okay, that's quite interesting. So let's get on to community rehab teams then. So let's, for the sake, just for the definition, from six weeks, say, through to six months to a year, maybe, how many people feel that that should be stroke-specific? 
How many people who feel that that should, could be stroke plus neuro? How many people who feel that that bit of the work could be taken on by much more integrated general generic teams? With specialist skills. With specialist skills. <laughs> Okay, and then what about post one year, um, you know, for the longer term stuff? How many people still feel that the specialism has to be there, that you are being treated by somebody who is spending the majority of their time doing stroke and nothing but stroke? How many... It depends on what their needs are. Go on, come to the microphone if you want to talk. Slowly, slowly. We don't want to have an orthopaedic disaster. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nikki Martin, Cantor Leading Cornwall for Community Stroke Nursing. It's about the access back in, and it is about, I think, early it definitely has to be. That's my personal feeling, very stroke specific. I think it's having the resource, and when we talk about neuro and stroke combined, that's fine as long as it's properly resourced. It is about the issue within the teams of, of what the capacity and caseload is going to be for those combined teams and I think like it is about the access I think the stroke specialist nurse over there if you've got long-term stroke specialist nursing um, that can then access back into the specialist therapist at a later date because it's still needed there's an awful lot of evidence out there that will show that going back into specialist <coughs> therapy services at a later date can improve outcomes and there's only one point I wanted to make earlier but I didn't get up bravely enough is like was it 12 15 years ago we had the Older persons, standard five, and then we followed it by the na national stroke strategy. Ago. Are we not debating for a national stroke strategy to look at maintenance of specialist services? And you know, I think I'm, I've been a nurse for 32 years. I started in stroke. It was a Cinderella service then, and my concern is if we don't look after it, it goes back. We do need to look at sustainability transformation plans, but we also do have to very much maintain the improvements we've made in specialist services for our patients. So I think that what we have there, and thank you very much for that, it's a really nice way to end, is that actually I think we do have to be a little bit more flexible perhaps than um, even the guidelines would allow us to be, that many people feel that the, there is very little separation between the neuro skills and the stroke skills, and that maybe the commissioners could be thinking around that, but there has to be an access in whatever the time after the patient's had a stroke to specific stroke expertise if that's what the patient needs. So I think that's the conclusion of the meeting. Thank you all very much indeed for speaking. Thank you.